Yo, 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 Thought Warriors, what is up? It is I, Van Lathan. And it's me, Rachel Lindsay. Yes, hi, Learning. Learning's on right now with the podcast. Um, Rachel, what, uh, how, was your, how was your weekend? My weekend was good. It was chill. Took care of some personal things. Had dinner with um, someone that I work with. Went to Delilah's. I hadn't been to um, the outside nice. spot yet. It was nice. Del- Delilah was nice, right? Because they did they they put it out. In the, shout out to Kenny Hamilton over there. Uh, Delilah, they they put it out in the parking lot, but they built like a little thing. Can't even tell. And then they said they're about to cover it with a tent, which I was like, well, doesn't that mean it's oh, you indoors? You can't cover. You can't cover. Don't but cover. But they're going to do something with a tent. That's what they no. said. Fuck the tent. No? Like, okay. Tell, well, that's what they H-Wood said. H. Wood Group, my man over there. Look, <laughs> that's what they said. <laughs> they don't do the tent. Okay. Don't do, like don't. The it tennis. would take away from it because it is a very nice ambiance that they have going on. Ambiance that they have going on over there. So, uh, yeah, did that and um, yeah, it was chill. I went to Soul Cycle. I hung out with Soul my Cycle. friend's kid. I saw some of my other friend's kids. It was uh, nice. I had uh, a lot of personal time. I've seen Delilah. I've seen Drake and Delilah numerous times, and he's shown me love. And Delilah, dap me up. He's like, "Yo, what's up, Van? How you doing? Do Do you want?" Uh, uh, good for you. Uh, I don't know. You, do you want a, a a hand clap? I'm not quite sure what you were looking for there, other I mean, than not, to name drop. I mean, I'm not name dropping anything. I'm telling you something that factually happened. And because and, I and asked, it was not because you asked. But we were talking <laughs> about. But we were talking about Delilah. And it was something, and it's something that happened. And I'm gonna be honest with you, in a real way, it seems as if maybe you could possibly be hating. <laughs> No, 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 no. You're you're mistaking that I don't... We talked about how I feel about Drake before. Maybe if you had said somebody different, I would have been like, man, I'll let you know when I'm jealous. I will definitely let you know. There are some people that you kick it with that I'm jealous about. Like who... Like, let me ask you a question. Who... who you're in LA now. Who do yeah. you want to see? Is there anybody you want to see? Because you're going to no, see them. Not really. I can't think off the top of my head like who I would just be like, man, that's so-and-so. Right. You gotta get like, get at me. There's there's somebody I just can't like if Idris. If I him. saw Idris, that would do it for Idris me. Elba. Idris Elba. Yeah. Idris Elba. That would Idris do Elba. it for me. If you told me he dapped you up, I would be like, I would extremely jealous. We have the same manager. Karen? No, Arunde Garrett. <laughs> we have the same manager. I thought you told me your manager's name was Karen. I got two managers because I always bring the black. You know what I'm saying? I got people. I got black people on my team. So shout out to Karen Kenny, my manager, but also shout out to Orunde Garrett, my manager, because I always I have I make sure that I have black. people. You have black people on your team. Very yep. important question. Black people take care of my money. Black people take care of your money. Do you, is your agent black? I said black people take care of my money. Isn't that important? It, <laughs> Isn't that important? <laughs> Isn't that important? <laughs> oh, you gotta you gotta have black people on your team, man. Especially when it even if, if for no other reason than like. When you go for a meeting with like BET, right? Or you're up to host. I remember you, you just have people doing those and you just you look away. Plus, man, you do. They look no, at you I'm away. I'm like, maybe that's why BET never hits me up for anything. No, because they they're they not. Because you, because you know what I'm saying? Like, and then I have a my manager is a white lady named Karen. I love so, it. So so you know what I mean? And so, and she, by the way, family. Yeah, I, I wouldn't think you would have her on She's your team if she wasn't. Family. Been there since, through some of the hardest times. But, you know, we got a run day, too. And a run day, he, people have different skill sets. When, you, when you're talking to the culture, you got to talk. You got to speak the right language, Rach. So okay. you got to have black people on your team. If not, just have your whole team be black. It's amazing. All right, now, um, uh, we have an uh, incredibly, incredibly amazing guest. We're going to start the podcast with a guest today. Um, I'm very excited about this. Me too. Uh, well, yeah, she's amazing. Now, we know that out there, you guys, um, a lot of you are struggling to find yourselves spiritually during this time. It's a time of a lot of isolation. Um, it's a time of a lot of disconnection. And so some of you out there might be feeling disconnected uh, even from maybe God or whomever, whomever that you worship. Even if you just pray to the universe, you might find yourself a little stifled. We have an amazing guest today, Natalie Manuel Lee. She's the host of Now with Natalie on the Hillsong channel. She's going to tell us a little bit about her spiritual journey, uh, about her spirituality, and about how you can be a cool Christian. Uh, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. So right now, 
uh, Natalie is joining us. But before we get to her, let's take a break real quick. Look at this fit from Rage. Look at this little Rage, yeah. Rachel. Yeah. Rachel. She's a guest today, you know, and I and she's into fashion, so I'm trying to step up into my game, you know. Oh, that, Van, so, what happened to you? What happened to you, Van? So, so wait, Van's you're family. He's like wait, a wait a second. So you're you're trying to impress Natalie with fashion, and that's what you went to right there. Okay. You look like you would do the a right compliment. thing. Did I not? First of all, she looks very cute and beautiful. Thank don't you. try it, man. I ain't taking no tips from you, Van. None. I'm, I can't dress. I'll be honest with you. I can't dress. So what? Okay? Like, I, I can't, you know what I mean? You know, I'm glad we're rolling on this right now. We're, I, I'm glad we're rolling on this because we have a very, very special guest, an, an incredibly inspirational, smart, accomplished uh, television host. Let's, let's, wait, wait. She's got so many jobs. She's a television host. She's a, a, a brander. She's a spiritual advisor. She's a guru of sorts. Um, but she, uh, more specifically, is the host of Now with Natalie on the Hillsong channel. Uh, Thought Warriors, give it up for Natalie Manuel Lee. She's joining us today on Higher Learning. Hey, Woo! Natalie. Thanks um, for having me. Uh, no problem. So listen. Before we got into I don't know if you guys heard, but Natalie and Rachel were doing what people do. Black ladies do. They team up. Um, they team up oh. to hold brothers down. That's what they do. It's a team up. And they're talking about the fact that they both, if you guys are looking at the video, uh, Natalie, who of course, is always stylish. And Rachel, who looks like <laughs> a mobster from 1989. They all, both of them, looked at me and said, you know, I'm only wearing a white t-shirt. But the reality is, I admit it, I can't dress. I can't dress. So the contradiction in what you just said, you said we were teaming up on you, yet that entire statement you just made was dogging me. I just want I just want to be clear for a second. Right. I agree That's with it. Rachel. Thank you. See like what I'm saying? But I agree. My bad. It's, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. So Natalie, um, very interesting. The, the, the new season of Now with Natalie uh, is on now. Um, it is not on now on the Hillsong channel. And you have some amazing guests that you have for this season. Now, before we get to those guests, uh, I want to ask you about the pandemic. Um, and the reason why I want to ask you about the pandemic is because uh, you're obviously someone whose spirituality, you wear it on your sleeve. Um, and you oftentimes give other people answers about that. You try to help them narrow their focus so that they can see and walk in their spiritual light a little bit more. What was this entire time of isolation, distance, and being confronted with so much death? What was it like for somebody like yourself who normally has such a strong relationship uh, with God? Was there any point to where you felt like you were wavering or asking questions or you felt alone? Great question. First and foremost, I'm not a spiritual guru, but I appreciate you introducing me <laughs> as that is not who I am. Mm -hmm. um, second of all, this has probably been the most challenging year of my life, to be quite honest. And I don't know, understand how people have survived 2020 without faith because I'm barely surviving with faith. And I want to be honest with that and really transparent that even when you have all the tools and all the right answers, it's still very challenging. Um, and so for me in this year, it's just been a season of confronting, confronting the things that aren't so necessarily so comfortable, confronting the things that I needed to unbecome as opposed to become. I think we, we, we focus so much on becoming the things that we want to be and the next thing that we feel like we need to accomplish in life. But this season has, for me, has been a lot of unbecoming, maybe the traits that I've learned along the way of. And just being in constant counseling and kind of seeing the things that I need to individually work on. And I think, too, the biggest thing is because we're in this pandemic, we all want to control everything. And I'm a bit of a control freak. And so that's one of the things that I'm learning to unbecome. And so with that, I've had to fully lean on God. Like, I can't, we can't control, we can't predict what's going to happen. We can't predict what's going to happen in the election. We can't predict what's going to happen with this coronavirus, coronavirus, if you will. 
But for me, I've had to really press in and hone in on the Christ principles that I believe and just know that God is in control. Um, I read something the other day that was saying that we're all in a fuss because we're so we feel like we can't control what's happening. But the reality is we were never in control in the first place. And if we remember that and realize that, um, I think that we'll all be in a better position and a better place mentally and spiritually. So to answer your question, um, for me, it's been a season of unbecoming, a season of confronting and a season of just as we're isolating, it's almost like God is putting a mirror to you and just saying, these are the things that you need to address in order to continue on into your future. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to come in on the opposite end of that question because I, I am a woman of faith and I, and I like you that that's what has helped me through this year as well. But what if I could be a negative person and I'm sure I'm not alone when I, when I say that, okay, Van, th- this wasn't, this wasn't a, uh, an excuse for you to harp on that. If y'all watching the video, his eyes bucked, but, <laughs> but I, I'm a negative person and I, that, that can be my go-to at first. And it's something I'm aware of and I recognize and I try to actively combat. But on the opposite end, for those who are feeling so hopeless right now in 2020 with everything that's going on, and for maybe who are losing their faith because it's so hard to see God during this time of sickness and sadness and suffering, what would you say to those people who might be losing their faith? Yeah, great question. I would say, look at the history of God. Look at the equ- look at the equity of what he's done in your life. I think a lot of times we're so focused on that mountain now. It's like, yes, let's focus on this mountain, but let's be reminded of the, the 10,000 mountains that you were able to climb that you thought that you weren't going to get through. He always comes through. So look at the history of God. Look at the history of your faith. Look at the history of the characteristics of who he is and know that yeah, it's tough. And yeah, we can be hopeless. And I was actually praying in the shower this morning. And I just was reminded of, oh my God, I have to remember the history. You know what I mean? There's a song by uh, Maverick Music that is just like, God, I remember the history of who you are. And we sometimes are so focused on what we're facing now that we forget what we were able to overcome in the last season. So we just have to be reminded of those things so that we can continue to move forward. Mm. Um, so look, you have a great lineup of guests on this season of uh now with Natalie. You're really good guests. As a matter of fact, <laughs> including whoa, 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 whoa. I was about to say, I think this is probably overall the best season of Now with Natalie, just because of the guests <laughs> that you have. Okay. It's very, you know. It's tear jerkers. Like, I think I, whenever I'm around, whenever I talk to Natalie, like, we get to crying and stuff like that. Because, you know, Van tries to repress all of the, 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 he tries to repress it way down and Natalie just brings it up. Before you know it, you're like, oh, I remember when I saw God in 1996 and then you're balling on the show. <laughs> um, uh, but no, but you also have, I want to ask you about something because you have a, it's a, it's an eclectic group. It's, uh, of course, myself, you have Charlemagne, you have Jordan Woods, uh, who else? Help me out with some of the other people that you have on the show. This, this Angela this Rye. Angela we have Rye. Lecrae. Um, A.R. Bernard, who's a pastor. Yvonne Orgy from Insecure. Mm. Um, Latoya Luckett. Yourself. Mm. Um, right. Kristen and Danny Adams. Um, wow. It's robust. Yeah. So I want to ask you about something. So you have Jordan Woods on there. Jordan Woods is a friend sure of do. yours. She's a friend of yours, right? Sure is. Okay, so let me ask you something about, about, about this specifically. I went to Jordan Woods' Instagram and... <laughs> wait, what? No, no, seriously. No, it's a real question. I went to Jordan Woods' Instagram and she has an OnlyFans. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I, I love Natalie. <laughs> no, I really like... I, lo- I have no idea what that is. It just it's just like an account to where you can sometimes sell sexy pictures and videos and stuff like that. Different people have different limits and lines on there. I want to ask you something about that though. Not specifically as it relates to her, but specifically as it relates to you. So um she's a young girl out here expressing herself and stuff like that. You know, she's got all kinds of different things. She got the OnlyFans, whatever. As a Christian, 
How can you be a friend to somebody? Because there are a lot of people right now who are listening to this who don't have any faith. And there are a lot of people right now who have faith, but then may have friends that don't have it. They still want these people in their lives, but they want to be able to share this part of themselves. Let's say, not specifically using an example of Jordan, but let's say there is somebody in your life who you might disagree with a lifestyle choice that they might have or something that they might do. How do you become, how do you act like a cool Christian and not someone that's always speaking fire and brimstone on someone and might turn somebody off from a spiritual revelation that might help their life? Like, what are, like, it doesn't seem that there are many of them out there anymore. Seems like everybody's telling you what you can't do. Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think overall, it's just meeting people where they are. You know, at the end of the day, it's simply meeting them where they are. And I think that a lot of times we don't realize as Christians, when people want to push the word down, they th- down your throat or Jesus down your throat, they want to throw scriptures at you and all those things. And that can actually run people away. So for me, it's, it's we are, we are called to, to those that look like us and to those that don't look like us. So who am I to say to, to distinguish or dictate who I should be around because of their moral beliefs. Um, if anything, your actions should speak louder than your words. Your character should speak louder than your words. So it's not like I can't be around a non-believer. I have a lot of friends that are non-believers. I have a lot of, you know, industry people that are non-believers. But for me, it's, I'm still learning from them as much as they're learning from me. And I have no room or say to condemn anybody of what they do or what or how they look, what they what they're dressed like, their mistakes or frailties. And hence that's why I did season two on shame. Because we want to cancel everybody because we think that all these people need to live up to this certain standard. And God is saying, come as you are. Who who do we think we are to say that to condemn them because of maybe they're not living the same life or the same way that we should live. So to answer your question, did God cancel some people though? No, he cannot. You know that. God canceled some people. Yes, he did. Oh, absolutely not. So right now, do you have an example? Yeah. The entire, all of Sodom and Gomorrah got canceled. (laughs) He canceled all of them. And by the way, they canceled Lot's family but even looking at them, looking back, boy, that's a, so I'm gonna tell you something. That's the most gangster story in the Bible. Rachel, I, how do you do it, girl? Like that's the most gangster story in the Bible. I'm gonna I be real with him. you, y'all, because the real the real thing is y'all not reading y'all Bible and y'all don't understand that y'all missing out on top flight entertainment. God told Lot. God said, "Don't look at him." I said, "Don't look at him, Lot." And Lot turned and and and, and, the, the, and he's walking, and then his wife. I don't know. The if she story liked, is not to be amusing. The story. That's a theme and a meaning That's behind it. It funny. is not to entertain you. He I turned to salt. That. That's funny. A pillar That's of funny. salt. I don't care. A pillar of salt. <laughs> to turn to the salt. That's funny. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All of those stories are fun to me. They're uh, always... Them, them in the furnace? The fiery furnace is, is funny? <laughs> You can have people flipping through the Bible. <laughs> hey, I'm telling you, read your, re, read your Bible. Read your Bible. Look but at no, man, you, Shadrach, Reshach, and Abednego. Okay. That was my mom's favorite story. She <laughs> telling me about it all the time. My mother yeah. loved that one right there. Um, but no, you were saying, I cut you off the last thing. You were saying to answer the question, you don't, you, you don't feel the need to be, I, I assume what you were saying is you don't feel the need to be constantly harping on someone and trying to inject the holy into them. Absolutely not. I think that, yeah, again, we just, we need to meet people where they are. So to, to answer your question, that's kind of how I do it. I just acquiesce and meet people where they are. And if they ask me for something, you know, I'll tell them my truth mm-hmm. and, and, and in a way that's not condemning and in a way that's not saying this is the only way, even though I do believe that this is the only way, you know, mm-hmm. so. Yeah. Right. Hmm. A lot of what you deal with is about searching for your purpose. What are some questions that we should be asking ourselves to find the purpose in life or our purpose in life? Uh, what are you passionate about? What are you compassionate about? What are your gifts? What are your talents? What are you empathetic about? What would you actually do for free? Mm. Even if you had all the money in the world, what would you do for free? So those are some of the questions. That's a good question. So, <laughs> yeah, so, well, what would you do? <laughs> what would you do for free? I mean, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> you, um, so you, you know Jesus, like you, him hang out, you know, 
like you know, you know Jesus, right? Yeah, so do you. So I, I know Jesus, like, you know, but I like call him on the phone. He like stops by to visit you. It's a little different. Um, so my question is, there's an election coming up in a couple of weeks. Who do you Ooh. think Jesus would vote for? I pray, <laughs> hope, surrender, <laughs> put my hand down. Obviously, I'm going for Biden and Kamala. That's like not even a question. Mm. Um, but I don't believe that he's in politics. I believe that he is in, um, I believe that he's more so in just the principles of things, if that makes any sense. Mm. Um, but do I believe, do I believe that he would vote which way or another? I, I'm going to say Kamala and Biden, but Hey, I, I don't know. I find this interesting. Okay. I'm from Texas and I went to a Southern Baptist school my entire life. And I see a lot of people on social media that, like you said, you know, Jesus wouldn't be a part of politics. I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, but they use religion and use their beliefs when it comes to politics, voting yeah. on one issue. I, and I know we have a lot of people who are probably listening that, that either themselves or maybe have family members or friends that think that same way. What do you say to that? Because that's that's one of the hard things when it comes to this election, because it's it's a hot issue. Yeah. I literally, and I say it, it's all over my Instagram. I, I mean, I'm very vocal about it. Do not manipulate God's word. What we are doing is manipulating his word, a one section of the whole Bible to get what they want. In the Bible, God speaks about, there's parables about the marginalized. There's parables about the least of these. There's parables about that one sheep. And when they get so frustrated, when we talk about, you know, all the taboo to topics and especially the Black Lives Matter movement, they get so defensive about it. You know what I mean? And I always say, if the truth is making you angry and uncomfortable, you need to recognize why the lie is making you comfortable. And that's how I feel about, you know, some white Christians some white evangelicals. Again, I'm very vocal about it. Um, Beth Moore, who's who's a big doghouse in, in the theologian world, basically was saying that we have a lot of leaders that are manipulating the word to sway other Christians to make them think otherwise. So that's what I would say. Oh, yeah. The, the school I was referring to I grew up in. Pastor who leads it, Robert Jeffries, Jeffers, Jeffers, whatever. Big time. Yeah. Big time. Big time. Big time. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. It's bad. They, they're going to have to answer to it. They're going to have to answer to it. And it's very, very dangerous. And, you know, I think because this year has been a year of exposure, those Christians that want to use that one thing in the Bible, um, they're going to have to repent. They need a heart change. They need a heart transplant. It's just exposing the, the posture of these people's hearts towards other people. But they're uncomfortable because they're so used to leading and being vocal and being on the front line that when the Black people finally say, hold up, you got it wrong, they're uncomfortable. But, you know, it's just, it's unfortunate, but it's, it's I'm grateful that it's happening, to be quite honest, because yes, I am a voice in the faith world, but it's, you know, I'm also a black African American Christian woman and I have I have a voice and I have a job to do and I have to, a job to expose these people that no 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 you got it all wrong. Uh listen I I definitely think that Jesus would vote for Biden but I do think <laughs> I, I I do I, I do I just think that he would but I do think that this is yet another reason for Biden and Harris to, you know, just have a more full-throated conversation about their criminal justice records because, let's face it, Jesus was a black man who was arrested and thrown in jail. You know what I mean? So if, you know, if Jesus gets to the ballot box, he might have some questions for Joe Biden about the 94 crime bill because he was a victim. Really, they, they really, really, when you think about it, they really got Jesus on a trumped-up charge. They, they, like, really... Think about it. We people talk about it's weird. It's weird because I just this is I just had to start, and I've never had to start before. You know, all of these people on the right, they're so pro cop, so pro law enforcement. It was law enforcement 
that did Jesus in? Fake charge. No real, no, no real trial. Pontius Pilate washed his hands. You know what I'm saying? Didn't get involved. Probably should have got involved. And then, you know, Jesus is up there next to two guys who was actually stealing. And, and, the, and the, it's just weird. So I, if you look by the example of Jesus, we should all be abolitionists. We should be against the carceral system. We should be against the death penalty. We should, Jesus was a victim of all of these things, man. We don't pay attention to his life. Right? I feel like he's trying to also show you his extensive biblical yeah. knowledge. <laughs> he he didn't got from the Old Testament to the New Testament. What are you talking about? <laughs> Natalie said it too. <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm from the, the South. Next- no, I'm I get it. I South. know everything you're talking about. I understand. Yeah. I just think it's funny. <laughs> I'm from the South. Oh, I love um, this. Um, so it, it, to your point, I'm going to ask you about something. Uh, you said something that's very interesting. You, you talk, calling out white evangelicals. Uh, Lecrae, who you had on your show. Oh, yeah. I felt um, about this. Uh, got into a little trouble. First of all, Lecrae is a great, amazing, yeah. amazing guy. <laughs> Lecrae is one of, listen, let me tell you guys something. First of all, he's big as hell. Because when you meet Lecrae, he's like 6'6". He's like a tight end. He's like, you nigga big as hell. You know what I mean? He, back, in, like, back in the day, he'd have been like a Samson or something like that. Lecrae, a big guy. Um, but no, he got in a little trouble earlier because he was on a stage or something with someone and some pastor said something fucking ridiculous. Um, he said that uh, he doesn't look at it as white privilege. He said he looked at it as white blessing. Um, uh, and that slavery had to have happened or something like that so that, you know, white people had the position that they have in America right now. And Lecrae sort of nodded along. I texted Lecrae and I told him not to get down on himself because one thing that happens when you walk into a church is like we're on a podcast or we're in different things. When you walk into a church, you let your guard down and you and you open up your heart. And so when you're in a church, you never see more nodding than you do when you're inside of a church. You're not on God. You're, you're trying to be filled with the Spirit. But it did illuminate something. So I don't have any issue with him over that. If he had to do it over again, he'd do it differently. But, you know, in, in the space that he was in, it's a, like it's like playing an away game almost. You're there to kind of connect with people. And it sometimes can feel counterproductive to be like, no, fuck you, that's not right. You know what I mean? Um, which we all know that it's not right. And he knows that it's not right. Great guy. But it did sort of speak to what you were just talking about which is the fact that one of the oldest forms of segregation in America is the church itself. Uh, there are literally, I talk, I talk about this sometimes, like it being in Baton Rouge, um, there's homogeny in so many different things. And one thing that there's homogeny in in Baton Rouge is religion. We worship the same God. The exact same God, same thing. We do it a little livelier, you know, and it's a little bit more fun, but we worship the same God. But we do it two completely different things. What do you think it says about humanity that not even people who both believe that there is an ultimate supreme being filled with love, light, guidance, and goodness, not even that idea can make them sit next to one another? Oh, oh, it says that racism still exists. It says that racism still exists in the church. What do you mean? That, that's, that's what it says. It says that racism is 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 still in those pews. It's and that's what I was going back to saying about about the heart transplant. There there's a lot of things that are still in people's hearts that have been buried, either if it's learned or or not learned. It doesn't matter. It's still there. And so what that to your to your um, question is that yeah, racism still exists, especially in the church, unfortunately. Well, it goes back to what you were saying, too, about manipulating the word, like using the word a certain way. I, I don't know if I've ever said this on the podcast, but when I was in school, um, I remember there was a, a white guy who liked me and I had Van and then I had... I, can, can people see your facial expressions, <laughs> Van? I cannot. <laughs> and I remember there were some white girls that were very upset by it. And they were telling me the Bible says light and dark aren't supposed to mix. And I can't even remember the, I want to say the verses like Galatians, Ephesians, but ba- the, the, it's more so saying like, um, it was saying, do not be unequally yoked. It's that verse. Hmm. And then like the latter part is like lightness and darkness yeah. aren't, but they were taking it to mean skin complexion. And they were, and that is what they would teach throughout 
or was taught, I guess, to them in their local churches or whatever. So you're totally right about manipulating the word. And Van's also making that face because my my husband is not black. So that's why. Uh, <laughs> like, okay. That that's where that goes. Anyways, if you could have a dream guest on your show, because we know it wasn't Van, what who would you <laughs> want it to be? <laughs> bam, bam. Shots fired. Question. Actually, to be honest, and I want everybody, all the listeners to hear this, and Van, which I've told you, Van, the um, interview that Van and I had last year about season one, um, in that conversation that we had, it birthed the concept of um, season two. So, mm. which is shame. So literally when I left the interview with Van, I got in the car and I was like, hold up, wait a minute. We really need to tackle and talk about shame because there's a lot of us that deal with it. So I'm grateful that um, he was on the show, even though maybe, you know, maybe not my dream guest, but. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the dream guest? That's a fantastic question though. Jeez. I can't say like my mom, can I? No. You can you can't. say your mom. No, <laughs> she can't. She can't say her mom. I mean, I definitely would like my mom. Probably um Viola Davis or Oprah. Oh. Okay. Great. Yeah. Viola great. Davis or Oprah. Two. Let me ask you this before before we let you get out of here. We know you gotta go. Um, would you ever want to do interviews with people? who don't have God, but people who need God. Yes. Like, yes. would you, you like people, would you sit down with like an R. Kelly? Yes, you do, 100%. Yes. You, you, you would. Because or I you, think we you, all are God beings. You know, I think for my strategy for season one and season two was for people that, you know, just had an ounce of faith. That, that's really all, all you need is just to have an ounce of faith because everybody that I had on the show isn't, devout screaming Christians at the top of their lungs. That that wasn't the strategy. The strategy was literally to get people that look like us and sin like us and to speak about their relationship with God or their lack thereof. And so a hundred percent, yeah, that's potentially where we're, you know, maybe heading. But whenever you see or hear me, you know, I just want it to be a representation of faith, but not, nothing to push it down your throat. I don't want that. Mm. And can I ask you this? We see when you talk to people who are so inspiring and affect so many different people, you always want to know who is it that inspires you? Mm. So that's the question I want to ask you. Who inspires you? My mom. I knew you were going to say that because that's your dream. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she just, she's been through, been through a lot and been through it all. And she's just, you know, I think the way that she lives her life is, uh, is a representation of, of Christ. Um, in the tough seasons and and in the prosperous season. So yeah, my mom for sure inspires me. I gotta be honest with you about something, man. What? I, just make sure you guys know. I'm sure that Natalie's mom is an amazing woman. She will almost <laughs> have to be to have such a fantastic family. But if I was Jerry Manuel, <sighs> who is Natalie's dad, and who is a former major league baseball manager, a very successful man. Okay, who was like literally, literally one of the biggest managers. Everybody know Jerry Manuel, won a bunch of games, did all of this, minor leagues, baseball and all of this. I'm still selling, man. It's tough out here for the fellas. Jerry Manuel will do all of this stuff. You want to talk to your mom, you know. Natalie's brother, uh, fear of God guy, Jerry Lorenzo. But mama is always about mama. Yep. It's always about mama. You have the connection yeah. with mom. That's black. Yeah, man, we get to show that. She, she, she's, she's the rock of the family. She brings us all together. She's the one that instills the things that are instilled in us today. You know, my dad is just the one that refines it all, but she's the one that pushes it down our throat. I love it. <laughs> wow, it's amazing, <laughs> Natalie. Uh, tell them where right now where they can go watch now with Natalie. They're gonna want to see it. Uh, when I say some great interviews, Charlemagne curses too much, uh, but uh, for, probably for Hillsong. But some great <laughs> interviews on there. Where can they go watch it? Where can they see it? Where can they get more of this inspiration? And not just inspiration, but information for people who might be looking to change or 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 be inspired by somebody else's life. Uh, first off, your interview is November 19th. So BT does hey. coming up. Um, you can find it on YouTube. So all you have to do is go to youtube.com backslash Hillsong channel or YouTube search now with Natalie. 
um, or go to now with Natalie show on Instagram. And my Instagram is Natalie manually, but yeah, you can find all of it on youtube.com. Mm. All right, Natalie, we really uh, appreciate you joining us today. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, it was fun. You guys are fun together. You guys are actually hilarious. Oh, thank <laughs> like you. We can't stand each sister. other. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. That's our... That. I'm just kidding. <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate that. All right, sister, I'm going to get up with you. Appreciate it. All you. right, I appreciate you guys. Thank Bye. you for having me thank on. You. Bye. Bye-bye. Uh, did you learn something from that from that interview? I love that Natalie said, you got to meet people where they are. I love that. Uh, And I think that's so true. And I think that's in every single aspect of life, you know, not even just in a spiritual aspect, you know, whether it's your coworker, whether it's a friend, whether it's a family member, you have to meet them where they are. I love, loved that. And I also loved what she said about, you know, the question I asked her about people feel hopeless and you, Mm -hmm. you start to lose your faith starts to waver during times like this. And she said, you got to look at the history of it. Mm. I, I loved everything that she had to yeah. say, but those are the two things that stand out the most. Yeah, it's amazing. Like, uh, both her and her husband, amazing people. Just great people. And, you know, we know that the whole, look, I get it. We have a very diverse audience here at Higher Learning and we have people that, some people that are of faith and some people that might not be of faith, but a lot of those lessons are evergreen, right? Meeting people where they are will just make the country a more united place to live, you know? And that's mm-hmm. hard to do. It's hard to do when there seems like there's always so much on the line, man. Every opinion is life or death. Every single situation is life or death. Sometimes hard to meet people where they are, but you gotta, you, you gotta try. Now, speaking of meeting people where they are, I don't know if you saw this. What um, is it? Uh, but Jeffrey Tubin, do you know who that is? Do you know who? Oh, you know I who saw. Jeff? I didn't open the you article, but I saw the alert. Yeah, Jeffrey Ooh, Tubin. Shocker. So uh, Jeffrey Tubin is a CNN legal. Uh, analyst and commentator and contributor. Uh, He also, though, writes for, I think it's The New Yorker. The New Yorker. He writes for The New Yorker. And he was suspended, okay, because he showed his dick on a Zoom call with uh, people from The New Yorker and with some other group. Okay. They suspended Jeffrey Tubin because his dick is out. Jeffrey Tubin's dick was out. And they suspended him for it. I'm livid. I'm livid about this. Why? This is one of the worst things I've ever heard of. It makes no sense. That he got suspended or his excuse? It makes no sense that he was suspended. Because? Because it's stupid. And I'll tell you why. Number one, if if they think that Jeffrey Tubin pulled his dick out on purpose, then you have to fire him and not suspend him. Okay. But if, in fact, it was an accident... Why would you suspend him? Okay. I will tell you why. I guarantee you that the results or the investigation is inconclusive. They can't quite say if it was on purpose, right? You got to trust him on that. You know, he's Mm -hmm. saying it was an accident. The people who watched it may have felt like it was on purpose. So rather, they're splitting the baby here. And it's like, you know what? We're just going to suspend you. So we do reprimand you. But it's not enough evidence for them to completely get rid of him. You can't tell because the people who saw it are probably offended. I'm sure they're offended. But if you think that there's a a 1% chance that on a Zoom call that Jeffrey Tubin got his tube out and showed it to everybody that he works with, if you think there's a 1% chance that that happened, that means this nigga's crazy. And you would have to get (laughs) Jeffrey Tubin not just off the airways and off the New York. Jeffrey Tubin would be, that's like weird trench coat, come here, lady, ha, 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 type shit. <laughs> like, like, you, know, you, you know what I mean? Like, you, you, there's no way I'm telling you it's that you could keep him around if you thought that that was the case. They don't want to prematurely fire him. They might, there might be some speculation, but if they can't prove it, they can't fire him. He's saying it was an accident. I'm telling you, that's why they took these, they, they uh, reprimanded him in this way. I'm telling you. But what do you think? Let me let me just ask you. Based on what you, when you read this story, do mm-hmm. you think he did it on purpose or it was an accident? I think Jeffrey showed his dick to them people. And I don't know why. I can't. I don't know why Jeffrey showed his dick to them people. I think he did I think too. He did. But I, I don't know why he did it though. But I will say this though: that that has almost happened to me. Okay. Well, tell. So then, I'm surprised you're not. Okay. You're not defending him because you know that it can him. happen on accident. It can, it can happen on accident. Okay. You know what? I changed my mind. I, it probably was an accident, but I, it's just hard 
because I did catch myself. So this is what happened. I do two podcasts here for The Ringer. One, obviously, is this one, Higher Learning. And then the other one is Way Down in the Hole, the best wire rewatch podcast in the history of the world with the amazingly talented Jamel Hill. Uh, now, when we do these podcasts, we shoot them two at a time. Okay? So we'll do episode seven or eight, season four, whatever, whatever, whatever. So sometimes, well, most of the time, you shoot an episode, you don't log out of the Zoom. Everybody pauses their shit, and then you go and do something for the 10, 15 minutes before you come back. But there was one specific time that uh, I had somewhere to go after the next podcast, and it was, it was a time thing, so I didn't want to have to wait and shower after the next podcast and put my clothes on to get ready to go. So I decided that in between the break in the podcast that I would just go and shower, okay? And then come back and change and do all my stuff and, you know, just have a different out- outfit on and just leave right after. Well, when I got out of the shower and came back in to the room and I sat down, I was like, oh, shit, is my video still on? And, and, and it was, and by the way, <laughs> I, I, I literally froze for a second. I'm like, yo, is my video st- is my video still on? And then I looked and I remembered that I had just, cl- I clicked it off. I clicked it off, but I couldn't remember if it was still on when I sat down. And if I would have sat down, it'd have been meat to camera to everybody there with no fault of my <laughs> own, a complete accident. It can happen. All the Zoom calls that have happened over the last X amount of months, you mean to tell me this has never happened? Of course it's happened before. I wonder who would have been my guest co-host if you would have done that and been temporarily suspended from the ringer. But Spotify. see, wouldn't that be bullshit, though? To suspend me... It's better um, than being fired, man. Like, No. It's better than being fired. But I mean, I... Listen, lesson learned. You need to, anytime you step in front of the computer or step away, you need to make sure you're fully clothed. Didn't Jeffrey that happen Tuba. in Keenan Ivory Wayans? He did it on purpose. It was a, a funny guy. Was it? Yeah, because he, he was sitting down there and he was giving an address. That was actually like a, a, a commencement speech that he was giving. And then he got up and he walked away. Uh, you could tell he works out. Um, now, and you know, <laughs> uh, look, just real quick before we move on, I know Jeffrey Tubin's. Penis is a hard subject to move on from. Yo, uh, let's take a break real quick. Um, I got to say something, man. I just want everybody to hear my voice when I say this. Can y'all please leave Aisha Curry the fuck alone? Wait, people are mad about her new look? It's, they're not just mad. Like, they're being stupid. I've never... I've never like Steph and Aisha are just the nicest right? high yellow high yellow black people <laughs> in the world. They just some they're just some benevolent light skins, right? Because they don't they don't let it bother them. But if it was me, I, I get the fuck off of my wife's case, man. Like every time she does anything or says anything, they're looking for reasons to get all up in her shit. So wait, what were they upset about? I saw her display her new look. I thought she looked cute. And she said it was yeah. just for a second. So she went blonde, I guess, which is, I yes, guess, she did. once again, she went blonde. And then she posted a picture, or they posted a picture, somebody posted a picture. And people didn't recognize her. They were like, I, oh. I will admit, I did right. think that she was somebody else when I was scrolling in my Instagram, and then I recognized him. And I was like, right. oh, okay, she changed up her hair. Right, but it's it's... People were saying all kinds of crazy shit. Let me ask you a question. Is it inherently wrong for a black lady to go blonde? Do you consider that to be some some kind of way trying to adhere to the European beauty standard or something like that? Do you uh, think that? It hasn't Cardi worn blonde wigs. Nikki wore blonde wigs for a long time. People go blonde all the time that are black. So I don't understand why it's an issue. I guess with her because she's light skinned and I and her eyes, she's she's green eyes, and then she had the blonde hair. They felt even more so that she was trying to fit a standard. But that's that's who she is. She's got green eyes. She's got light skin hair. Why are you making a difference between her having blonde hair and Cardi and Nikki when they wear blonde wigs? That's not fair. Would you say that the Curry slash Rivers 
alliance is What's the an alliance. It's an alliance. Okay. Callie Rivers is married to Steph's younger I, brother. I, I'm aware. Yeah. You know, three point shooting basketball family. And then you have Austin Rivers and then you have my man Spencer. Shout out to Austin and Spencer, my guys. Um do you do you think that this is the finest assembly of light skins that is currently can you think of there's only one family that is like close to them in light skin privilege in lights in light skin in the light skin power rank. There's only one family. You know what that family is? No. The the Zoe Kravitz <laughs> uh Lisa Bonet <laughs> Jason Momoa. Jason Momoa. All of them together. That's the only family that's threatening Man, the Curry I don't know. Rivers I never family have of looked light at them. skin genius. I ne- what, why I, is that wrong to say? Why is that wrong what? to say? Why is that wrong to say? Well, first I'm, tell, of tell all, you why. called them light skin privileged. Then you called them light whoa, 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 whoa. skin genius. I didn't mean the light skin privilege. I didn't mean the light skin privilege. Okay. I'm just, that, privilege. That's, this is my, why my reaction is off of that. Because they've worked for it. Steph had to shoot a lot of shots to be as deadly as he is from Valley. And let's be honest, he came from Davidson. It's not like he went to like a top nine. Like he worked hard to get to where he is. Did you ever see him at Davidson? I absolutely did. Yeah. But I'm just saying it's not as big of a school, I guess. It's is what not I'm as big saying. of a school. But by the time he got to Davidson, he that was, little nigga was. Fucking ridiculous. Carried the whole team that, on his back. That was stupid. I remember watching like, yo. And it was, and by the way, be honest. So when you see like light-skinned athletes do stuff, you don't go, God damn, look at that yeah. creamsicle flying through the air. You don't ever think, like you don't ever see like Zach Levine or Aaron Gordon or any of, because it's really, if you look at it, Absolutely if you look not. at it, you don't look at it. You the, got some yeah, deep, deep, Rooted no, issues being, with the light skin. I'm dead serious. Whoa, I've never, whoa, whoa, whoa. I've whoa. never looked at Steph and been like, looking at him a certain not, way because he's light but, skin and bald. But not, <laughs> but not, but not Steph though. I'll tell you why not Steph because Steph is just the most hyper skilled player we've ever seen. So you can see that his work ethic and stuff like that. Okay. But when you see, but I, when I was when I was coming up, I'm gonna be honest with you. When I was coming up, I never saw. Guys like Zach Levine and Aaron Gordon and all of these light-skinned dudes that had crazy bounce like that. Even in Southern Louisiana? No. No. First of all, do you understand the Creole guys like that that got light-skinned? They don't play sports. They're too busy having sex with everybody's wives. Like, they don't, like, they, they, like, they don't have... They, <laughs> like they, it's like, it literally, they, like, they, all those guys that look like that, those guys don't have sports. They're too busy sneaking out of your... your, your while you I am thinking just, about people I knew back in, in school. And I yeah. I really didn't know any light skinned basketball players in the area that I grew up in. See, I'm see thinking, I'm thinking, with. but I but I didn't, but I don't look at at light skinned basketball players and and think a certain way, Van. That's you. <laughs> I, you know what I think? You know what I think just happened? What? I think I just exposed a whole problematic side of myself that I'm glad that we could talk about here uh, on yeah, this podcast. That's what I'm trying to point out. It's not so much that there's anything to it. But it's just, I look at it and I go, wow, like they joined forces as, you know what I mean? And it's the same thing that happened to Kravitz, to to the Kravitz family. It's like they joined forces. It's like Lisa Bonet was like, hey, I'm biracial, light skinned. And then Lenny Kravitz was like, yeah. And then like Zoe Kravitz, is Zoe Kravitz half black or is she She, 25% black? I think she would be technically half black, half white. Because she's got two quarters. Yeah. Wait. That's, I'm, two well, halves. First of, all, first of all, two halves. Zoe Kravitz, two halves. Zoe Kravitz is a black woman. No doubt yes. about it. It's a yeah, black yeah, woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm not saying, I'm just saying, but that's... You're talking about her so, ethnic makeup. So two yes. halves, and then she's half. She comes from two halves. Yes, she would technically be half black, half white. Amazing. <laughs> Get down this hole. I can't. I can't. All we were talking, y'all leave uh, Aisha Curry alone. No, not just leave Aisha Curry alone. Aisha Curry is doing her goddamn thing. Aisha Curry has managed to make herself a brand independent of her world famous husband. Aisha Curry is smart. She is centered. She is a godly woman. And they look like they have a whole I'm a big fan. hell of a lot of fun. I'm a big so fan. Let I, me pull a let me pull a van here. One time I was at Good Morning America. Here we go. And I'm, I'm pulling. I'm, this is this is what we call pulling a van. I was at Good Morning America and I was walking by, and Aisha Curry was walking by, and she stopped me and she goes, "I just want you to know that I love you." 
And I said, me? I've wow. never felt so seen. I said, me? Thank oh, you. Sure. Leave her alone. Leave her <laughs> alone. Leave her alone. Let, let the Currys do their thing. Uh, now, I don't know mm-hmm. if you saw this, but there's something that's been going on out here in LA and you can easily tell that it's happening. It's hilarious to me. So I live... Uh, <laughs> it's not funny. It's hilarious. Okay? It's, and I, it's, I'm going to tell you why it's not funny, but keep going. It's, I don't care about that. I know what you're going to say. It's hysterical. Okay? It's hysterical. So I live um, like Beverly Hills adjacent here. You know, like Beverly Hills adjacent, like just below what they would call the slums of Beverly Hills. Is where I live. Stop. You live in a good neighborhood. Stop trying to make yourself sound not, not a certain comparing, way. You live not, in Beverly Hills. Period. I'm not compared. I don't. Not really. I yes, live, you do. It's too, close to, it's too close to Pico, whatever. Um, but when I'm on my walks and my runs, this happened, started happening like a month or two ago. When I was on my walks and my runs, I would walk and run through Beverly Hills. And I would see a lot of people that I didn't used to see in Beverly Hills. And it was very, very empowering to me. I loved it. I've seen it as well. Oh, you see it. You know, we live live close in the same area. I I would see a lot of people there that I didn't used to really see in Beverly Hills. And I was like, yo, man, this is dope. Because I love it. I love to see us go to these stores and stuff like that. Now, to be honest with you, um... There's a reason. Sorry, that, this is you're talking about something. I this is funny. Right. Go ahead. There, <laughs> this is something there, different. <laughs> there's a reason why that's happening. Okay, not all the time, but um, there are a lot of the high end stores in Beverly Hills. Uh, how do I put this? A lot of the high end stores stores in Beverly Hills have had some new clientele because. Um, some colorful clientele. Some colorful clientele <laughs> because of certain ways that you can, I guess, take advantage of the unemployment system here in California. Just take advantage of it. You know, file your claims. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you go to, uh, I don't know, the, the Fendi store, or the Gucci store, you might think that you're in the Fox Hills Mall or, you know, Baldwin Hills or something like that. You know, but I, I love it. I love it. Now, it's actually come to a head now because one guy might have fucked up the game for everybody else. There's a rapper named Nuke Bizzle. <laughs> <laughs> you can just stop there. <laughs> Nuke Bizzle. Shout out Nuke Bizzle, man. Hey, I like Nuke Bizzle. I'm not even going to lie. He's from Memphis, but he's been in California for a while, and there's a reason why. Nuke Bizzle has dropped a song recently called EDD, where he extols the virtue of scamming the unemployment system. And the song itself is actually kind of hard. It's actually very hard. But uh, he talks about it. I just said, EDD. EDD. He talks about the fact that, you know, you got to sell cocaine. All he's got to do is file a claim. Anyway, New Bizzle put the EDD song out. um, And apparently, he was truly living his raps because they arrested this nigga. (laughs) Uh, Rightfully so. They arrested New Bizzle, and now he is facing multiple years in prison because it turned out he was actually doing the things as far as scamming the system that he was rapping about in this song. I will ask you, do you in any way feel sorry or shed a tear for one Mr. New Bizzle? You said, do I feel sorry for him? I kind of feel sorry for New Bizzle. For what? This dude had 92 debit cards and had <laughs> racked up $1.2 million. I would like for it to be known that Gucci is no longer taking the EDD card. See? It's an, it's a, Fucked it up for a, everybody. Always got an OD. Always got an OD. Gucci, Gucci on Rodeo OD. Drive is no longer taking the EDD card. I don't know if other stores have followed suit, but they're not taking it because they're these debit cards, right? I don't feel sorry for him because, <laughs> first of all, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You left a paper trail to your right. crimes, like America's dumbest criminals. He should be cast, should be the cover of it. Also, this is what people accuse people of who, act like, You're scamming the system. There are people who truly need EDD cards. And here you are 
with 90 plus cards and you got over a million dollars playing the system and taking away from people who actually really need it. This is a problem. Not one, not two, 92. I don't feel sorry for you. And I don't feel sorry for anybody else who gets caught up in this mess. And I'm very curious as to why you do. Uh, because I, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I, bail them I, out. I, I, well, now I'm not going to bail New Bizzle out. I mean, New Bizzle is monumentally stupid. Let's just get that out of here. New Bizzle, New Bizzle is a different level of stupid, but it's a poverty crime, right? To me, it's, 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 it's definitely scamming, right? Correct. It's definitely Correct. scamming, but it's hard for me if nobody is hurt, and this is a big-time flaw with me, if nobody is hurt, by the way, I can't say that nobody's hurt though, because I did watch, I did watch something about uh, about this where a woman who actually had a, uh, one of these cards was actually getting text messages in real time as her card was getting bled. Like she had a card, and it maybe had like I don't know, three hundred bucks on it or something. Like she was getting messages. Your cards got two ninety, two two fifty, to this, to that. As they're probably you know somewhere in Dave and Buster's going crazy. You know, like it, doing the whole deal. Uh, I don't know. It's hard for me. Is I just I think that I grew up with around too many scammers. To to uh, I to, know them too. Yeah, I think I grew up around too many scammers to look at New Bizzle. I get. I got a question. What's the difference between New Bizzle and say uh, Martha Stewart? Well, Martha, Martha Stewart. Stewart went to jail. So right. So what I'm saying is, I'm so not that's saying, what I'm saying, but I'm saying it's wrong either way. And here's the thing: it does hurt people, Van, because you look at it, and you look at this, and they might cut back the government funds because of they people scamming the, the, season, yeah. uh, the system like this. This is yeah. it does hurt people who actually it need it. Yeah, you're right. This is not victimless, but I just you know it, <laughs> it is I, funny. It, it, it is funny, it, but it but also it was it was interesting to me because when I would there was a certain poetic justice to it as I would walk through Beverly Hills and I would see all of these stores that typically uh, would try to make sure that they had a certain type of clientele, right? They didn't want these certain type of people in their stores. They didn't want these certain type of people in Beverly Hills. Yet and still now, in a depressed economy, I just found it very interesting that fair or unfair, uh, legal or illegal, these were the people that were sort of keeping the city afloat because really it's all you saw for a while. It's all you saw for a while. But there are a lot of unintended consequences and we I'm, I should be serious about this for a second. One of the unintended consequences is a friend of mine uh, who is the uh, vice president of um, Versace Shoes mm. was stopped in Beverly Hills uh, and had people look through his bag. What happens is, and this should not be the way, this is not the new business fault or anybody else's fault. The police should do their jobs honestly and thoroughly, no matter who is, uh, is, is, is doing what. But a lot of the arrests that they've made in, in connection to this particular scam have been just on stopping people. Yeah. Uh, stopping people who are leaving these high-end stores seeing how many debit cards they have on them. And a lot of the money that they've seized, they've seized a lot of cash and stuff like that. Anytime you give the cops carte blanche to do that, now, once again, it is not the fault of any... We don't have to be responsible for overzealous police. We don't. But it is going to be an unintended consequence that Beverly Hills is going to be hot for a while just because they yeah. went so hard. I'm saying, man, if you're going to scam, spread it out. You know, it's Beverly don't Hills. Don't people a road map. Then it's, it's Malibu. Go down to San Diego. Don't like they. And by the way, don't he, scam. Yeah. Okay. New Bizzle. New Bizzle, dumb as hell. So stupid. By the way, you know I'm new to the area. So mm -hmm. when I first went in that in this area we're talking about, and I saw, you know, like so much diversity, I thought, oh my gosh, it wasn't like this the last time I got here. When did this right. happen? This right. is beautiful. I didn't know. I didn't know until I asked somebody. And they were and like, they, and they told you mm. about this scam in the EDD <laughs> yeah. over there. Let me tell you. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. This scam in the EDD. We'll see. But now, now the EDD is in a whole I lot said, of trouble. Look at us. We know about Neiman, Sachs, yeah. David Yurman. Going like, and, and it's, it's crazy because you see it and you like, yo, man. Because normally in any other time, when you're you're in Beverly Hills and you see somebody leaving a store like that, you know, it's rapper, actor, whatever. These are just the homies from Miami and Atlanta, man, and Baton Rouge. And I love it. I, I like to see, I just like to see, it's messed up because I'm, I'm torn because I like to see happy black people. 
But there's nothing they, wrong with that. And they walk out of those stores and they just happy. They got that belt. They got that. But I don't want to see it coming at somebody's expense. So whatever you're doing, new, but what, what I'll tell you what, if you are scamming, don't fucking rap about it. I don't know what, I don't know what's up with you little guys. Because they think they're untouchable. They think nothing right. can happen to them. Case in yeah. point. Well, it did. Uh, yeah, I, I got to get to Am I an Asshole? But before we do, let's stop for a second and take a little break. Um, now, I, 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 I have a Am I an Asshole for you. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Okay. So Usually it's yes, but keep going. We'll see. We'll see. So, new place we moved into over here has three bathrooms. A bathroom wow. Connect, there's a bathroom connected to this office. There's a bathroom and a master. And then there's like a half bathroom in the front for guests. Recently, I had somebody come over to the house. Okay. Hanging out. You know. Uh, and it's like, yo, can I use your bathroom? And they went and they used the bathroom. They didn't use the bathroom. They used <laughs> The bathroom. Okay. And they're probably eating some great probiotics, a lot of refuge, a lot of fruit, because it was a situation. He basically went and shit up my, my guest bathroom. Just like fucked it all up. stopped it up? No, not didn't stop it up, but just like, first of all, if you say you have to use the bathroom and then you're in there over like five minutes, I know what's going on and the anger always just starts to rise, right? But then after you come out, and it's like a, it's like a little doom moment. I actually had anxiety over it. It was the flush, and then a door opened, and then you're hit with it. And it's like, and I was furious. I think it's rude to take a shit in somebody's house. I would never, if you guys come over there, whatever like that. No, I never would. I never would. I wouldn't do that. You know, well, I don't I have as many bathrooms as you, but. But I wouldn't come and take a shit in somebody's house like that. I think that that's rude. Am I an asshole? Actually, no. Hey! You're not. I, I personally would never, ever do. If I, if I did, I'm not okay. And I need you to know that. Like, you right. might want to have 911 on speed dial. Something's wrong with me. Just, just, mm. just, just so you know. Um, <laughs> is the bathroom near the front door? Well, yeah, because there's a Because that would bother me as well. Yeah, because there's a... I mean, not really, kind of, but like it's... The, there's the door and then it's across the living room and then it's the first it's bathroom public. in the hall. It's like... It, that, all that bothers me. I've, there's just a level of privacy when it comes to that. And when I, when I welcome you into my home, the first thing that you do, like, I don't want you to be that comfortable. And, that, right. that, and I, so maybe I'm an asshole. I don't want you to be comfortable enough where you're going to relieve yourself in that way in my home. You can't wait till you get home. If it's they just, were spending the night, yes. Well, I mean, if you're spending the night, then we're we're sharing the house. Correct. But, but, but as I'm a talking guest, about a, a visit, and then you just go in there and open your asshole up, and 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 ex, I don't like to get yourself. that vivid with it. But right. <laughs> my dad had an issue with that because I used to have one friend who mm -hmm. used to come over to our house and, and every time <laughs> he had to go to the bathroom. Right. <laughs> and my dad would be like, "You can't have him come over anymore." Like All straight right. up. It was like, he ain't allowed to come back until he could control it. So maybe that's where I get that from. It's so funny. Like, old black men are so funny. <laughs> One time, uh, we, would, we, like, we would have days at the house where we would, um, we would let, let the horses out and get on three-wheelers and ride around. And, like, everybody would enjoy the country. My mom would cook and stuff like that. And so one day we were having one of those days, and my boy Ian came over. And, and, uh, and after he came over, you know, we were going to go out later on that night and go to the club and stuff like that. So Ian was like, I'm just going to bring a change of clothes and then I'm going to take a shower or whatever. I'm going to leave. I was like, all right, cool. And so uh, my dad walks in the house and then when he, when my, when he sees Ian, Ian's coming from the bathroom with the towel on and the shirt and he's going in my room so he can change. And I'm sitting on the couch playing video games with my other homeboy, Ryan. And my dad goes, did Ian just take a shower in my house? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And he goes, <laughs> I'll never forget this. He goes, you mean to tell me that nigga had his balls out in my house? 
<laughs> and I'm like, yeah, he did. Like, he had to take a shot. I would assume. I, I mean, I can't verify, but yeah, I would assume that his, his balls were out. Boy, don't you ever let another man come drop his nuts in my house. I'm like, and I remember looking at my mom and like, is he being serious right now? <laughs> that no, no one can take a so shower. So you never had guests over is what you're telling me. Not like that. Man, when I was a kid, I was instructed not to eat from anybody else's house. Yeah, no, that's that's would, that's big and in, in with black families. Yeah, I'd be like, yo, like, hey, Van, would you like something to eat? Nope. Van, you want something to eat? No. Van, seriously, we all about to eat dinner. You just not going to eat? No, I'm not eating your food. I don't want it. So definitely never anything like that. But by this time, we had all known each other for such a long time. And I'm, I'm wondering if now my worst nightmare has come true, if I'm now my dad. I'm here to tell you that, yes, I mean, we have a segment on here that is, am I an asshole? And usually when we discuss this segment, you have a story to tell about you being a bit of an asshole, and then you have a story to tell about your dad. So I'm wow. here to tell you, yes, mm. you are him. Wow. Wow. It's interesting the way that happens right there. I love you, big guy. <laughs> uh, now, we, we, we've had a, a lot of fun in this episode, um, even though Natalie enriched our souls. There's one thing I do want to talk about. A story down there in your home state, uh, mm -hmm. Texas. Texas State University has yeah. stopped its diversity training program um, after Trump threatened to cut the federal funding uh, to the school now. So if you guys remember, President Trump a little while ago, I think he issued an executive order right, or something like that. And the executive order had to do with um, banning or rebuking uh, anything that was diversity training or what he said reframed American history. I think I'm paraphrasing in a racist way. Basically, Trump doesn't want, it seems, any organization um, private or public to, uh, I guess, discuss the fact that there might be problems in their hiring or their past or their diversity. He doesn't want us to have any conversations about diversity. He doesn't want to have us to have any conversations about the systemic inequality that has gone on in this country. Incredibly dangerous. Incredibly dangerous to limit diversity training. Now we see this playing out. We've seen it played out a couple of times. Uh, your thoughts, Rachel? It's wild. It's wild because on one hand, and you have other people saying it as well, that President Trump has done more for black people than any other president other than Abraham Lincoln, right? Like that's mm -hmm. that's his line that he loves to spew out and then talk about what he's done for HBCUs and and what he's done with with unemployment. Yet these are things that are done in a subtle way that go under the radar that you don't see. So when you're chanting that he's done more for black people, then you don't see how he's also trying to keep them down and yeah. hurt them. Because it's because this is it, it's I guess I shouldn't be surprised because we have a president who doesn't believe in systemic racism. So why would I expect anything less? Right. He doesn't believe it exists. He doesn't believe that there's a problem here yet. With this executive order, what you're doing is encouraging systemic racism. You're allowing it to stay mm. in place because you're saying that we're not allowed to have discussions about race and deep-seated racism within our country and the history of it. And you can't talk about privilege because he said it makes white people feel uncomfortable. That right. is why they're not allowing this. They're not allowing any talk because they're saying it's divisive and anti-American. This is wild. This is a president who wants to act like what is actual history. He wants to keep us in the like the way we we learned history, right? We learn history, certain things about historical figures that we have come to learn is not true. President Trump wants to keep us that way because he is only looking out for people who look like him. And that's exactly what this is. It's wild to me. And I'm and I really wanted to I'm glad we're talking about this today because I don't know if a lot of people get it. I don't know if a lot of people realize how hurtful this is, because if you have been paying attention to this this summer with the Black Lives Matter movement and, you know, amplifying black voices and everything that we have the world's attention, there have been a lot of companies and organizations that have dedicated to hiring more black people and to having more black leaders within their companies. And now President Trump is threatening to take away money for them if they do this, calling it uncomfortable for white people, calling it anti-American, calling the trade 
training to talk about diversity and make people feel included, anti-American. So if you're saying that diversity and inclusion is anti-American, then what is America? Hmm. Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, it's fantastic points all around. I mean, to me, uh, a, a couple of things stand out. Number one, uh, President Trump has touted all the things you said he's touted. But he's also... Uh, he's also wanting black voters to believe that he, through his platinum plan, is interested in um, revitalizing and helping out black communities. I guess my question is, is if there's no systemic racism, why do we need a plan? Mm. If there's no systemic racism, if there's nothing specific that's happened to black people, this is an example of a president who is talking out of both sides of his mouth because... um, there's really nothing behind his word. So if, if if there's nothing systemic that happens to black people, then why do we need to intentionally look at it? The right. reason why we need to intentionally look at these things is because, they, is because they were done intentionally. And we need to look intentionally at things that have happened to all different types of American groups that don't get their fair shake in this country. Um, but me being black, I'm going to say black Americans are at the forefront to me, of that list. It is a generational crime, a multi-generational crime, what has happened to us and how we've been exploited. And it's high time that America take a look at that. But it's impossible to do that, impossible to do that, without first confronting the fact that what happened, happened. And this is not prestidigitation. This is not spooky witchcraft on history. This is just the facts of America the facts of where we live and what has happened. So I don't think that anyone should be able to run from those facts or anyone should even want to run from those facts. You know what I mean? The first thing that you got to do before you decide, uh, you know, for me personally, you know, I lost a lot of weight a long time ago, right? And the first thing I had to do before I did anything was stand on a scale because I needed to know the truth about where I was. Mm. I need to know what that number was because in having that number Let's me then set another number mm-hmm. that that is reflective of success. Okay, this is what I want to do. But you can't just start without first addressing what has happened and what hasn't worked for you. Right. And I just don't understand how anyone could claim to be serious about bringing us together as a country um, without taking a magnifying glass and looking at some of the, what, what's happened in the past. And it just, to me, it, it further... Uh, it just it just further tells me just what a con man um the 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 president is and by the way the president can be a con man he can be entertaining you guys he can be whatever all of these things have real world ramifications the fact that we are not going to get to finish counting in terms of the census you know that president trump uh and them were so adamant about the right. census count not finishing now you're going to have communities all over the place we're not going to get an accurate count where there's very little chance we get an accurate count. You're going to have communities that need resources all over the place not get the resources that they need. If you are, in fact, the president of the people, why would you in any way stand in the way of people being represented and counted? It just cuts completely against all of the bullshit branding that they do. Right. Um, but that's it. Very, very dangerous time. That's why you guys and us all have to be aware. You know what I want to hear? I want to hear from everyone about whether or not me and Rachel are assholes because we don't want y'all to come fuck up our house. <laughs> I want all Well, listen, we know we're in a safe place. We know we could go to each other's places and nothing would happen. It's not, it's not happening. As a matter of fact, you should get a fact, sign. I should get a sign. I should get a sign. I should definitely get a sign. I'm for it. I should get a sign. But, but here's another thing. There is a fitness room right next to 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 my apartment, mm-hmm. like literally right across the hall. Fitness room. It's not much of a fitness room, but it's a fitness room. There's a big ass bathroom in there. There's a big ass bathroom in the fitness room. You know what I mean? Big ass bathroom in the fitness room. Go use the bathroom in the fitness room. I'll, I'll give you a little scanner. Beep beep pop boop. If you got if you know you got to go over there, you're gonna change the whole fucking ecosystem of somebody's apartment. Before you do that, go to the fitness room. Because by the way, that's a trick. Real quick trick before I leave. Back when I was back in my early twenties, and you'd have like a girl, and you go to a hotel or whatever like that. Remember back Bayou Classic two thousand four, right? 
Now, she's in a hotel with me, with, right? You, but you know, you're drinking and all that stuff like that. It's going to come a time that you have to take a shit. You know what you do? You go to the hotel lobby. Yep. You go to the hotel lobby. Wait, can I you, ask you? Sure. What did you say to your friend when he finally came out? What the fuck wrong with you? Did like, your friend the, listen to the podcast? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm like, yo, what's wrong with you? Ain't nobody tell you to go in there and change the, the, the reality. Get out. Yeah, it's, it, it, get it's hard out. to be your friend. It's hard. It's hard it's to be it's your great. friend. <laughs> it's great to be my friend. It's great to be my friend. You know, it's great to be my friend. And by the way, you know, he knew what he was doing. Because he was all grinning and shit when he came out of there and stuff like that. And by, it was an unscheduled visit. I personally an think. Unsched- so he came uh, over to use the bathroom. <laughs> I, Rach, I fundamentally believe that this dude was on his way back south where he lives and couldn't go. Remember, most of the public restrooms are closed. Right. And he was thinking, <laughs> I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a pull up on Van because we didn't even get a chance to really play the Madden. I'm going to pull up on Van, right? Because nobody really comes in. I'm going to pull up on Van, kick it with him for a second, fuck his bathroom up, and then I'm going to go home. Because I, I kicked him right out after. It's very That's funny. You need a sign. So y'all help Van come up with a, with a creative sign to let people know what's up. Don't do it. Don't <laughs> do it. All right, Rach. Um, we are out of here. Uh, the next episode, I'm going to have my reactions. It's very, it's a very exciting time for me to episode two. Oh, that's of right. The Bachelor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, People big, love we, you as a batchy. They're loving your recaps. It's happening. We're, and by, by the way, every single day, we're careening down the, uh, the fucking aisle towards November 3rd. Uh, here pretty soon, we're going to bring in some pollsters. Uh, to try to make sense of the race where it stands um, and whether or not you can actually believe and trust the polls. Uh, mm. If, you, if you're if you looking at it, you know, Biden has a pretty pretty sizable lead, but Clinton was in a similar situation in 2016, so a lot of people are skittish about that. But we will get to that on future episodes of Higher Learning. For right now, we out of here. Take your theme caps off. Do not stop thinking, though. I am Van Lathan. I'm Rachel Lindsay. 